culture and environment are often called the cause of crime in the inner cities. But today you will discover the power and effect that a Christian father has on his children and his family. Today you will hear how a man of God prayed for, mentored, and was involved in the making of a great man of God. The son this father prayed for is now a world leader and preacher that has ministered to hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. Today, the power of praying parents will be heard on Old Man, New Man. Welcome to Old Man, New Man. I'm glad that our guest today is Pastor James Black from the North American Division. Welcome, Pastor Black. It's good to be here. We're glad you're here, and you are the youth director and young adult director for North America. That's correct. And how long have you been in that position? I've been there for about ten and a half years now. Excellent. Now, Pastor Black, you have a tremendous story and testimony found in your book, God's Got a Plan, and I'm in it. Yes. And I was happy to read it, and there were times my wife caught me laughing (laughs) and asked me what I was laughing about, and there were chapters in your book where you tell your story. Tell us where you grew up and tell us about your family. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, a uh, southern boy here. So uh, had a great time growing up in the south. Uh, grew up in a large family. Savannah. A uh, large family, uh, mom, dad, and uh, seven sisters, and there were two boys in the family. So pretty large family. <laughs> so there were nine of you. Yes. yes. Okay, and in Savannah, Georgia. And was it a, a middle class, upper class, lower class? Was it kind of like the hood? We live on the west side of Savannah, so west it's side. classified pretty much as the you know, low-income uh, area of the city. Uh, uh, we love family. We love the, the neighborhood, but it was sort of the hood, is what you would call it nowadays. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, your father and your mother were very significant in your life, and there was a time where they both accepted Christ. Yes. Were you already born at that point, or was it before you were born? They actually met about a year before I was born, uh, uh, were baptized, and I came along uh, nine months later. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. And so you you had an older brother and seven sisters. Yes, I had an older brother, uh, and actually I'm the middle child, so there were four uh, uh, under me, uh, four younger mm-hmm. sisters, and uh, three sisters older and a brother. And uh, uh, and that was as a result of two marriages. Uh, when my mother met my father, uh, she was a widow uh, with uh, four small children at the time. And so she met dad, and, and he had five. And now. So, from the very beginning of your story, you bring out the fact that your father felt a call to ministry. Yes. At one point in his life. Yes. But he felt that it wasn't for him. But he made a covenant or a promise to God. Tell us about that promise. Yeah. Dad, Dad was an incredible man. Mm-hmm. Um, always uh, felt that he was called to, to preach. Uh, uh, and, and God spoke to him through dreams because I think because of his limited education, is, uh, could not read and and those kinds of things. Uh, he also had a speech impediment. Mm. And, and because of that, he felt he just could not preach. He could not do it. But uh, he said that God gave him a dream that he would have a son one day and that that son would, would grow up to be a preacher. And sure enough, he had four uh, girls of his own and, and a son. I was his firstborn. And uh, uh, I guess I'm a preacher. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so something was to the dream. <laughs> but how you got to be a preacher is what your book is all about. Yes. How yes. God was in yeah. it and God's plan was being unfolded. Yeah. Now, it's not easy to grow up in the neighborhood you grew up, and there was violence, there were drugs, there was crime, Mm -hmm. and uh, you were very close to your brother, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Jesse. Jesse was a good guy, Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, lots of energy, and I think, you know, uh, before my mom met my father, you know, she was a a, a widow, and, you know, she was trying to raise these young children, so Jesse was kind of the man of the house Mm -hmm. until my dad came along, and and that created a little tension here and there because he was the man. Now there's another man coming over trying to be the man and that kind of thing. So he, he grew up a, a bit challenged in, this, in the neighborhood. And, uh, but uh, he was my older brother, man. And all I knew is I want to be like older brother. And, and you uh, say that he looked out for you, huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I if mean, they bothered you, they, they had to yeah, look out for yeah, Jesse. Yeah, you had to deal with Jesse. And uh, he could hold his own very well in the neighborhood. Uh, and at the time, you had to. If you couldn't hold your own in, in the neighborhood, it, it wasn't a good day. And yes. uh, Jesse was definitely to fall back on. Now, what happened to Jesse? Um, you know, Jesse had some struggles and uh, a, get, a, a good heart, uh, a great kid. But, 
you know, the environment and, 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 and what we were dealing with at the time was tough. And there were times when he didn't make some good decisions and so forth. And the day came when, um, and there were some rumblings in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, we'll never know the, the, the true story, but there were some things happening in the neighborhood. And, and supposedly uh, some friends came by and they were going to go swimming. And uh, all we know is that Jesse didn't come back. Oh, and, no. uh, and he died that day. So Jesse died that day. Yeah. Yeah, and you had your suspicions about his death. Yeah, there were a lot of suspicions about the death. Uh, uh, all the stories told were a bit different. And uh, uh, several weeks later, you know, when my life was somewhat challenged, I, I put two and two together, realized there was more to it than just an accident. And uh, different things that were on his body from what the funeral director told us and so forth, we knew that there had to be some kind of scuffle or some type of, you know, altercation. And, uh, but again, what, it, what happened actually, we'll never know. But uh, he did die uh, under questionable circumstances. And so you grew up in an environment where there was violence, there was crime, uh, there was great risk of life, and, and yet you're a preacher. Mm -hmm. What role did prayer and family worship play after Jesse's death and in your development? It played a huge part. Um, no matter what we saw on the streets, no matter how many alcoholics we saw out there, no matter who was getting stabbed, no matter you know, how many, uh, you know, police sirens we would hear and that kind of thing. Uh, growing up in a home where you had a mom and a dad, you know, morning and evening, calling us together to pray, that became a foundation. Did you always want to come pray with them when nah, they called man. you? No, 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 no. <laughs> and, and what was interesting is they would always call worship at the time the best television show was on. It's like, oh, man. It's like the moment gun smoke comes on, you know, we got to pray, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but... But, but the impact was there, and, and you know, I tell the story about one, one night I came in, uh, was hanging on the street, and something just said, go home, and I came home, and, and my mom and, uh, and my dad were on the knees praying, and, and I heard them call my name mm -hmm. in the prayer. They didn't hear me come in, but I was walking past their room, and, and, and they were praying, God, my son is out there someplace, bring him home, and, I, and I'll never forget hearing that, to think that, wow, the, uh, worship is not just a thing, worship, prayer is not just something that we do, but but mom and dad are actually talking to God about me. That See, made an impact. You're bringing this point out brings to mind the fact that when parents are praying for their children, not just as God hear, mm -hmm. but the children around them, mm -hmm. they hear it. And as you heard them pray your name, mm -hmm. that had a huge impact on your life. Yeah, yeah. Because days later, you you you, you would confront various things, and you realize that. Um, the spiritual battle is real, but you're not in it by yourself. Mom and dad are talking to God on my behalf. Because what, what you grew up experiencing was a pull from the world that was very strong. Mm -hmm. The culture, the neighborhood, the environment. It was just pulling at your soul for destruction. Mm -hmm. what, do, what would you say happened to most of the friends that grew up with you? Are they still around? Or? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, growing up, uh, a lot of the friends from the neighborhood, uh, they're no longer here. Uh, 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 many of them uh, have died, you know, tragically, um, uh, be it drugs, be it violence. Um, and and it's, it's strange, as I was writing the book, it, it, it just hit me over and over again how blessed I am because friends, of my, and these, these are childhood friends, you would call them. Not here. It, it, it's a strange phenomenon. And so they're all dead? They're gone? Yeah. Yeah, many of them. But you were pulled out from that. Yeah. And every time I think about it, it, it kind of gives me chills because who am I? You know, and, and I talk about being a pog. You know, uh, What's a pog? A uh, pog is one who is a product of God's grace. Okay. You know, and, and I count myself privileged to just be a, a product of God's grace. And so even though you were in this environment, you became what you became because of their prayers. Yes. And because of their involvement. Yes. Now, you mentioned in your book that your father had a vision for you from early on. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that vision. Yeah. Dad would tell everybody, my son's going to be a preacher. You know, my son's going to be a preacher. And that was, and, was that in your mind? No, nah, man, the, you know, <laughs> I wanted to play football and talk to the little girls, you know. <laughs> and uh, that was the last thing I was thinking about. But, but he had this vision. He had this passion. He, he always told people, uh, sometimes unexpectedly, we were, we were at family reunions uh, 
uh, gatherings, you know, this is my son, he's going to be a preacher. I'm like, Dad, give me a break here, you know. You, you know, you're ruining my reputation here with the girls a little bit, you know. <laughs> but, um, but, but he believed it. And so he was speaking words into your life. Yeah, yeah. Even from early on, and he was beginning to declare, mm -hmm. almost like the prophets and the yes. patriarchs of the Old Testament would yes. declare over their sons what mm -hmm. they were to become. Yeah. He was calling you. Yeah. As a preacher. Yeah. And as a result of that, you get a little reputation as a preacher. And, uh -huh. and, and, and I talk about when we played house uh, uh, as children, uh, interestingly, I would always be asked to be the preacher. And so during the, during the playing house routine, uh, I had to preach a sermon to my, 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 my friends in the neighborhood. And, and uh, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would be sweating and, 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 and preaching hard and so Fire forth. Fire It was fun, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I couldn't be daddy with the little girls, so I had to be the preacher, you know. So oh, man, I'll tell you. But, it, but the words of your father, I, I just want to emphasize mm -hmm. that, had such an impact over your life. Mm -hmm. And so often as men uh, and dads, we're a little careless with our words mm -hmm. and say a negative name to our right, children. Right. But I want to caution the dads to just be careful and to speak mm -hmm. words of life like your father did to you. Mm -hmm. And even playing childhood games, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were the preacher even yeah. there. Yeah. And, and, and I want to bring out the point that even though there were times I didn't appreciate it, even though there were times I would, didn't know exactly how to connect with it, those words were planted deep. And there were times I know there was things I stayed away from because daddy believed that this guy's going to be a preacher. And I didn't know how to connect the dots. You know, I just didn't quite understand how to process it. But I didn't take it too, you know, lightly. It, it wasn't a joke at all. But uh, because Dad always said it with a straight face. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it wasn't a, a joking kind of thing. No, this is my son, the preacher. And he introduced you as such. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Excellent. And so we see him praying for you. Yeah. And praying for you by name. Mm -hmm. We see him declaring good things over your life. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also something we've learned uh, with men's ministries and uh, something a new man does, and that is uh, preaching a good sermon without speaking any words. Mm -hmm. Now, your father was a deacon at his church. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Mr. Cain and about that experience with your mother and father. Yeah, uh, and, and that's, that's pretty deep in the book. Um, uh, uh, the brief story is uh, an elderly man, member of the church, uh, real sick, and no one was taking care of him, and Mom and dad volunteered to, to go and take care of this man. And, and, and interestingly, out of nine children, they only chose me to go with them. And we get to the man's house, and the house is just a mess. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Rats, roaches running all over the place. And, and they brought and you with them. They brought me with them, you know. And I didn't want to go, but, you know, you, you have no choice. You, you, you're going to go if they say you're going to go. And we get there, and we see this, this place in a mess. And, 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 and we finally go to Brother Kane's room in the back, and... Uh, and, and when the door opened, I'll never forget what I saw. You know, here, here lies this elderly man laying in his filth. Mm. I mean, just, just uh, a sight that is, is difficult to describe even to this day. And I was eight years old at the time. Eight years old. And, uh, and, and what my mom and dad did that day um, has, has given me a frame of thought and thinking now that, that nothing else was shaped. But um, they just took their jackets off and they got busy. Uh, they, they pull back the, str the spreads and you see all those filth and, and they just started cleaning him up. Dad started cleaning him up. Mama's heating the water and, and wiping the filth off of his body and so that kind of thing. So your dad was about 6'1". Dad right? was about 6'2". 6'2". Yeah. And so you're watching your father clean this man up. Yeah, yeah. Along with your mother. Yeah. And so what were you thinking at that yeah. point? Well, I didn't know what to think. I'm just sitting here because I'm amazed at what I see. And the, and the first thing is, this man is a member of my church. You know, and I, I, we, we've got a large church. The first thing is, how could anyone allow a human being to be in this kind of condition? And then just seeing mom and dad, and, he, and I remember he was so apologetic. Oh, brother and sister Black, I'm so sorry that you got to see me like this. And, and, but they wouldn't say anything. They, they were just busy. You know, they, they didn't respond saying, no, we, they, they, they just got busy with this guy. And, 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 and I'm seeing my dad literally wipe this stuff off this man. And then put his arms up under the sky and walk him to the bathtub and, and watch Dad scrub this man from head to toe. Mm. And I'm thinking, you know, that's my dad. Wow. That's my dad, you know. And uh, he washed him and shaved him. And Mom, you know, uh, cleaned the bed up and so forth. And then Dad, after washing him and shaving him. 
And I mean, I saw dad take the washcloth and get in between his eyes, up his nose and under his arm in his private parts and washed him twice, actually. And then picked him up and brought him back to the bed, um, massaged his body with baby powder and lotion. And so, uh, as you're watching this, James, you know, so many young people in, in the setting that you grew up in mm-hmm. watch their fathers mistreat their mothers, mm-hmm. watch their fathers uh, walk away from them, mm-hmm. violence, mm-hmm. Uh, verbal abuse. But here you are watching your father mm-hmm. take care of another individual with such mm-hmm. care, mm-hmm. strength, because he had it, mm-hmm. but tenderness. Mm-hmm. And that was beginning to mold who you are. Mm-hmm. even before you could understand mm-hmm. it. Dad was like a nurse to that man. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, he took care of him. I mean, he, he meticulously, you know, uh, I mean, just, just took care of this man's body. And, and the thing about it is, I think about it now, there were no rubber gloves. You know, there was, he wasn't concerned about what was getting on him. All Dad knew was, this man needs help, and I'm here today. And I'm sitting here just watching this whole thing. And as you're watching... Your character, your heart is being molded with these deep impressions that you write about now. Yeah, and, and because I kept thinking, that's my dad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's my dad. That's my mom. That's, that's uh, I mean, there's a certain proud, proudness that comes with that, yes. pride that comes with that, um, that, that, that you never forget. And, and, and after Brother Clean is all cleaned up, uh, that's when I noticed he locked eyes with me for the first time. And, and he asked me a question. He says, son, is are these your parents? And I looked at my dad and looked at my mom. And he says, uh, I said, yeah. He says, I'm about to, I, won't, I don't have much longer to live, but I want you to make me a promise. And that is, when you grow up, I want you to be just like your mom and just like your dad. Wow. And I looked at my dad with all this stuff on him. I what did at, you say? Well, I looked at my dad with all this stuff on him, my mom with all this stuff on her. They're, they're filthy. They're dirty. And I looked at them, and I thought about the fact that nobody else was here for them today. And I thought to myself, yes, sir, Brother Kane. Yeah, I want to be just like them when mm. I grow up. It was a promise I made. So yeah. God was already molding and shaping yeah. and preparing you yeah. for the worldwide yeah. ministry you now have. Yeah. Even years. there at eight years old. Eight years old. But your father's presence and your mother's yeah. work and together, yeah. they were molding you just by their actions. Yeah. Our actions are so important yeah. because our children are always watching what we do, yeah. what we watch, what yeah. we say, how we treat yeah. each other. And that helped you be who you call, become the man you now are. Yeah. And, and, and that was, for me, that was true mentorship, as I understand it now. Um, not just telling me about it, but I was there. Mm-hmm. And I was watching. And it's almost as if everything they were doing was a lesson, saying, pay attention because you're going to have to do this one day. And, uh, speaking of lessons, you talk about how your father uh, once made you rake some leaves. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, you thought you were finished, and he told you yeah. you weren't. Tell us yeah. about that. Uh, it's, it's called leaving no leaves behind. And, and, and dad, dad was something, man. Um, you know, uh, in our backyard, we had all these pecan trees. Mm-hmm. And you know how it is in the fall with pecan trees. Not only does the pecan, do the pecans, uh, not only do the pecans fall, but also the leaves. And uh, a yard full of leaves, and, and dad said, go rake the, rake the yard. <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah, but I had to rake the yard. And, I raked that yard, and you, you rake it up into piles, and, and then you burn the leaves. And uh, after I raked the yard, I came into the house, and Dad said, I thought I told you to rake the yard. I said, well, I did. No, you didn't. I did. No, you didn't. Go check. Dad, I raked the leaves. And he went outside, and, and uh, he picked up a board, and there were some leaves around the edge of the board. And he said, there was another little set of leaves in a corner here, in a corner there. And he says, I thought I told you to rake the yard. And I went out, and I raked the yard again, and discovered several more piles of leaves. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that's how Dad was. Um, no job is complete until it's done right. And that's what he taught me. And that's kind of continued with you into your ministry and to the work you do now. Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. And, and I think that kind of mentoring allows you to see what no one else sees. Uh, not only do I see the task, but I see it all the way through. And I, I kind of, it, it, it gives you a work ethic that, that, that says, you know, mediocrity is not a part of this plan. You know, I've got to do it. I've got to do it right because dad's going to come and check. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's almost as if our responsibility to God. We've got to do it right because he wants us to do it right. So your father helped you develop a work ethic oh, yes. that has brought you great success and God has used you in. Yes, yes. And I'm, and I'm very grateful, very humbled by that as well. And so while he made you work at times, 
he stood by you when you were having challenges as well. Yes. I know that uh, in your book you talk about your high school experience yeah. and how you were having a challenge even graduating. Mm -hmm. You were trying to get out earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and your father encouraged you right. to go forward and sign up yeah. for Oakwood. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't trying to get out early because I, I, I had a high academic uh, <laughs> uh, 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 scores or nothing like that. Uh -huh. uh, I was barely making it, and I, I make a joke about didn't know what a GPA was until I looked it up in the dictionary. <laughs> but, um, but it was tough in high school. I didn't really apply myself like I should, just trying to make it. But I did enough to try to get by. But it got to the point where, okay, where are you going to go now? What are you going to do now? And uh, dad, dad said, son, you know, apply for Oakwood University, you know, a Christian uh, university there in, in Alabama. And now I want to go to the Navy. And dad said, well, just fill out the papers and let's see what happens. And, and now I want to go to the Navy. And I think I want to go to the Navy for some defiance as well. I, I was trying to get away from some things. And I finally filled out the paperwork. And uh, at the end of the summer, I found myself, you know, at, uh, at Oakwood University there in Huntsville, Alabama. Because there was a teacher that was giving you some challenges, yeah, trying yeah. to hold you back. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a simple thing, a, a, a final project in class where uh, we had to do this project, and I, it was artwork included, so I did it in pencil, mm -hmm. and it wasn't in ink, and so he failed me because it wasn't in ink. And, um, and he also mentioned that he was an atheist and that he didn't believe in God, and I told him I did believe in God, and I was going to pray that God would turn this thing around. So it became a battle. Mm -hmm. And that's when my mother and father, you know, instilled within me, this is, this is your first, uh, maybe your first spiritual battle that you're going to have to see what God is going to do with the situation. So I began to pray and, and took that thing kind of personal now. Well, okay, let, let's see what God is going to do here. And uh, I saw God work a situation out that was just amazing. And God ultimately got the glory because I was enrolled in Oakwood University that fall. Excellent. And he also went with you to acquire some funding yeah. It took you to the bank or something? Yeah, Dad, Dad, we went to a, a, one of these loan uh, places to, to borrow some money, and, and that didn't go so well. You know, I think it was just, you know, um, Dad taught me how to deal with uh, unfortunate situations such as racism and those kinds of things. And we went to borrow some money, and, and I think the man was, didn't believe the fact that my dad wanted to borrow the money so his son could go to college. Mm. So it became kind of a joke kind of thing, not taking us seriously. And I got a little frustrated with it and told my dad, let's go. We don't need this money. And, uh, or we got to get the money like this. It's not worth it. And uh, we left. And, uh, and dad made a way uh, later on as to uh, getting the money to go to, uh, to college. At oldmannewman.com, you can watch this program and many others that will help you along life's journey. There you will also find the contact information of all our guests along with resources that will further equip you. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Ladies, when the men we love are strong and happy, we too are happier. We are here to equip the men with proven biblical information for success in their Christian adventure. Send us an email with any questions or comments you may have. Pastor Minner and I would love to hear from you. Old Man, New Man, dedicated to equipping God's men for this life and beyond. Now, October 28th, 2005 was a very important day for you. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that event. It was one of the most challenging days of my life. Um, uh, circumstances where uh, my wife and father ended up in the hospital the same week, uh, during the same time. We'd gone to see him because he was, he was ill. My wife took ill and they're both in the hospital at the same time. And it was just a crazy week. And, um, uh, that Friday, we discovered that both of them would have major surgery. And um, uh, my wife would go into surgery, my father would go into surgery first, followed by my wife. And to make a long story short, uh, that day, uh, while I'm in the holding area waiting for my wife to go in, I hear the code over the, over the, uh, the speaker. And uh, uh, someone's in cardiac arrest and, mm. and surgery, and I didn't think it was anything uh, relating to us. And, 
come to find out it was my dad in, uh, uh, in cardiac arrest. And uh, my phone rang, and I ran across the parking lot to see what was happening with him. And I get there, and there's chaos, and we realize that they're working on dad. And meanwhile, the surgeon calls me, and i got to run back across the parking mm -hmm. lot to my wife because, she, you know, they've got to take care of her. And um, uh, as a result of all that, that day my, my dad died, he died uh, that uh, day. on the surgery, surgery table. And uh, it was a tough day. And, um, and, and, and that day um, went back to see about my wife, and, and the enemy tried to tell me that, you know, my wife was going to die that day, too. And while my wife is in surgery, my mm. father has just passed, my wow. wife is now in surgery, and I call it a Gethsemane spot. I thought about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the burden he bared that day. And I couldn't find a garden, I couldn't find a tree, but I saw an artificial plant in the waiting area. And I went and found that artificial plant, I grabbed hold to it, and I just prayed to God, Lord, you're going to get us through this. Amen. And, um, and my wife came through the surgery, and, and, and God blessed. And, and it was a difficult time, October 28th, but, but when, it, when we got to the funeral, it was also a day of joy because of that. There's a three-hour funeral. Mom had asked me to preach the eulogy. I'm like, Mom, please. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, you're going to do it. And it only took me seven minutes to preach my dad's funeral because his life had said it all. It is him. His life has said it all. So although it was a difficult day, we rejoice in the fact that one day we're going to see him again. And his favorite chapter? Revelation and, 21. Revelation and, 21. Why, yeah. why is that so? Well, you know, Dad was not the best reader. And uh, whenever you would read Revelation 21 to me, we get all excited. And we didn't know why Dad would get excited. And then come to find out, uh, I, John, saw the holy city. And Dad's <laughs> name was John. And I, I, I realize now that every time he would read that, he saw himself, seeing the you know, city. seeing the holy city. And we take courage in that today, and that's why I know I'm going to see him again one day. Amen. The earth made now. And so what's the message you would tell our viewers, the new man that wants to be the best father possible? What would you say to him? I would say to the new man, um, let go and let God. Understand that you're in the plan. Understand that God chooses you to be in the plan. And we have to prepare for the plan. We have to protect the plan. We have to participate in the plan. And we have to provide in the plan. Uh, understand that you are valued to God. Amen. And he wants to use that. Amen. Amen. And so there you have it. We'd like to dedicate this program to the memory of John D. Black, yes. uh, Pastor James Black's father. And so thank you for joining us on Old Man, New Man. Remember, be the best dad you can be. We'll see you next time on Old Man, New Man. <laughs>